So um, I've actually started uh, a number of um, businesses in my career. So I'm 28 currently, but when I was about 16, I started building websites. Um, and that's how I put myself through school. I went to, to Duke with a degree in electrical engineering, computer science, computer engineering, and then to, uh, to Princeton. Um, and during that time when I was building websites and, and putting myself through school, I was sort of commingling my personal and my business finances. So I, I was using uh, Quicken and Microsoft Money since I was about, well, 16 or 17 years old. So it's been um, almost 10 years or so. And I was pretty religious about it. I would um, manage my, my finances, as it were, uh, every Sunday afternoon for about an hour each Sunday. Um, made sure all of my accounts would balance. And then um, I was involved in another startup where I was working 80 to 100 hours a week. And I didn't open Quicken for probably five months or so. And the problem with a desktop tool is um, if you don't open it up, it's not updating your finances. It's not pulling in the information. And once I, uh, I did that, it, it downloaded about 500 transactions. And um, they were all uncategorized. And uh, it asked me to reconcile all of my account balances. And it just seemed very tedious. Like, why would you want to balance a checkbook uh, in, in this modern day? And then uh, I decided there's got to be a better way, an easier way, a faster way to manage your finances than spend an hour every Sunday afternoon doing it. I want a tool where people can get in and out in five minutes uh, a week or less, and that takes like 10 minutes to set up instead of an hour to set up. And that was the genesis of Mint. The, the first thing that I did was come up with a categorization algorithm so that instead of seeing a big pie chart where most of the things are uncategorized, um, this algorithm knows that Safeway is a grocery store and Starbucks is a coffee shop, and it's smart. It actually knows about 20 million U.S. merchants. Um, and then I realized, well, that's a nice feature, but it's not a business. And so if the user knows where their money is going, that's great because they spend less time. They can set uh, budgets. They can see a, a nice pie chart of their spending. But... Um, as a company, it means we know where their money is going and we can help them out. We can find better prices on the things that they buy most. Like you spend $180 on phone, TV, and internet. You could bundle it together. Uh, you have $20,000 in an in old checking account that you opened when you were 17, and it's just lying around not earning any interest. You're paying all sorts of fees on it. Um, there's a better offer out there. And so Mint's business model became we'll go for free, and then we'll find these savings opportunities for you, you know, better interest rate on your credit cards, when should you consolidate your student loans, when does it mathematically make sense to refinance your mortgage, and Mint figures all that stuff out for you. Well, um, between the time that I created the alpha version and uh, we actually launched, um, it was about a year, and I did build up a team, so I got financing and uh, got some more engineers and some real professionals working on this. Uh, but the marketing plan was um, whatever we can do basically for cheap or for free. So probably nine months before the product even launched, we started a blog, a personal finance blog. And um, we had some of our own content. So we did this thing that we called Trainwreck Tuesdays. It was like people's worst financial disaster. And somehow reading about other people's financial mistakes makes you feel better about you know the mistakes that you, you're like, oh, other people really don't get it either. Um, and then we did sort of a what's in your wallet. We would talk to um, either Silicon Valley sort of tech celebrities or personal finance bloggers and ask them, what credit cards do you carry? Um, what uh, brokerage accounts do you have? Why did you choose these? Um, and that was an interesting segment. But most of our content came from other personal finance bloggers, and we would just simply cross-link back to their site. We got a lot of free content. And so by the time we launched, we had more traffic to our personal finance blog than our competitors who had beat us to the market, who had launched before us, uh, actually had to their entire websites. And then um, we added, you know, a send us your email and we'll put you on the beta, because we were building demand for nine months. And we got about 20,000, 30,000 emails 
uh, during that period, which was too many. We couldn't let that many people in all at once. So we actually said, okay, we'll give you special access to, um, to the beta uh, if you put up a little badge on your blog or your Facebook page or wherever that says, I want Mint. It's a very small little badge. Um, and then we looked at all the people who had those embedded. And what that did was it gave people sort of exclusive VIP access, sort of like, you know, the velvet rope treatment at a club. But it got us free advertising on 600 different blogs. Um, and not only the free advertising, in some sense, we got uh, the boost in search engine um, ranking because Google actually looks at how many people are linking to your site in order to determine your relevancy and your popularity. And so the more people who are linked to your site, the higher its page rank and the better you're going to do when people search for things like personal finance tool or budgeting software or whatever it may be. As far as the logistics of saving, I think most books, if you read them on uh, setting a budget um, and learning to save and learning where to cut back, uh, do it all wrong. Um, they sort of suggest you start out with your income, okay, I earn $4,000 a month and here's how much I'm paying in taxes, here's how much is rent, insurance, coffee shops, childcare, clothing, you, they, they make you list sort of 30 different categories. Most people don't know what they spend in those categories anyway, so it's an impossible task. It takes you like three hours to list all that stuff out and then you're supposed to come up with, okay, and here's my savings goal at the end after I've tweaked all these categories. It's just really impractical and it's also hard to track because they sort of tell you to write down everything that you buy. What um, I suggest instead is to use a tool like um, Mint or like Quicken, um, which will pull in all of your transactions automatically, categorize them automatically, and then set a budget against just probably the two or three problem areas that you have. I mean, most people know what they're real issues are, you know, maybe you shop too much, maybe you go out with your friends too much uh, to bars and, you know, you just need to set a, a, a budget on, on alcohol and bars, maybe it's restaurants, maybe you're a foodie, maybe it's too many video games or too many DVDs or something like that. People know sort of where their problem areas are typically, too many coffee shops. And so you just set a budget in two or three different uh, categories. Use a tool like Mint or like Quicken that will pull in your credit card and your debit card transaction. So put everything on a, a, a credit card or a debit card. If you're deeply in debt and a credit card, you're afraid you're going to get yourself into worse trouble, use a, a debit card then. But the important thing is um, those allow you to, to track your spending in a way that cash doesn't. And so all of a sudden you'll realize, oh, I went to Starbucks 36 times last month. Um, oh, I spend more on shopping than I do on rent. People have written in to Mint and said, I, I just had no idea that I spent more on this than, than I do on, um, I spent four times as much on restaurants than I do on groceries. Um, my press agent, Martha, said the first time she used Mint, she realized that um, she didn't have anything in her groceries category for the past month. She literally hadn't bought any because she'd been going out so much. And so you find these patterns. So you set a budget in those, those problem areas and Mint will show you how much you've actually spent historically. So if you spend $300 a month on restaurants, don't set a $100 budget. You're just not going to make it. You're just going to frustrate yourself. Set a budget of $250 or $225, maybe 25% less. And then if you make that, um, then cut it back each month. And a tool like Mint or like Quicken, um, Quicken 2010 is actually... It's really good. They use a lot of the budgeting features that I think they, they got from Mint. It's funny because I'll be owning both of those brands now going forward. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I look at the biggest areas where people have been cutting back, um, it's 40% of Mint users say they spend less on restaurants and cook more at home. And a full, I think, 90% uh, of people say they've actually changed their spending habits. So I think, um, at least for people in their 20s and early 30s, the biggest problem area is probably restaurants, coffee shops, and sort of your going out budget. Getting lunch every day, getting coffee 
in the morning or the afternoon every day, those, those sort of daily habits that, that maybe you don't realize. So sometimes I wonder from a psychological perspective if people have sort of a, a food and beverage uh, addiction. I, I'm typically a, a just drink water kind of guy. Um, I was um, a bodybuilder in high school, so I used to... Um, food to me was there are this many grams of carbohydrates and proteins and I need these micronutrients in order to grow and to be fit and uh, I, I ate in order to live not live in order to eat and I think most people are the opposite and so I know it sounds weird but the food that I eat it doesn't doesn't make a big difference and it, it never has so I've, I've saved a ton of money not buying a lot of alcohol not uh, going out to restaurants too much um, so I think it's, it's part of our, our, our culture and it's part of a social activity more than anything else. Um, the other thing is I think we're in a very consumer-focused culture where you're almost taught that in order to be happy or satisfied you have to spend on the latest clothes, gadgets, whatever. And uh, I think half the time it's in order to impress other people you know, the way you dress or the car you drive or what you spend, it's to impress other people with how, I guess, successful and rich you are. But you're not, and you shouldn't. And who gives a damn what other people think anyway? So uh, that mentality, I think, is very destructive. It's, it's the mentality of, of being a second-hander, of caring too much what other people think. I know it's an odd thing to say maybe when we're talking about uh, the psychology of saving, but I think it, that has more to do with it than anyone imagines. There's exceptions to the rule, but um, the reason that I came up with those three tenets is the field of personal finance is, I think, very confusing and overwhelming to people. If you look on Amazon, if you do a search for personal finance, there are literally 20,000 books written on personal finance. And there's no real reason for it. I mean, um, personal finance is pretty simple. You see content on um, the Internet, whether it's CNN Money, The Motley Fool, even you know, the Mint blog in, in, in some ways. And fundamentally, it can all boil down, all those books, all those articles, to three basic principles, which you name. Spend less than you earn, which means basically save money. Um, make the money you have work for you which means invest it, and then be prepared for the unexpected, which means you know, protect your downside with the right types of insurance, with diversification of your investments. And so the first aspect is um, save it. And uh, the best thing to do there is to set a budget on your problem categories. Uh, if you've lost your job, then saving money shouldn't be your primary concern. It should be finding another job and making ends meet. Um, the other thing that you can do to save money without really changing your behavior is to optimize your financial accounts. So most people seem to have the checking and savings account that they set up when they were 16 or 17. You went into your local bank with your mom and you set up a, a checking account and you're not being paid any interest. And if you have a savings account from Citibank, um, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, any of the big name banks, I guarantee that right now you're being paid between 0.1% and 0.2% interest, which is ridiculous because you can make 2% interest right now and if interest rates go up, the Fed changes the rates, you can make 3, 4, 5% interest. You're going to be earning a fifth to a tenth as much at most of the big banks as you could either get at a credit union or an internet bank like ING or HSBC or Emigrant Direct Bank or Ally Bank, which is the old GMAC. Um, actually pays the best interest rates around right now. I'm a big, big fan. And they have accounts without any fees. So if you optimize your financial accounts, get a high-yield savings account, put your deposits in there, get a credit card that, um, if you're paying interest on your credit card, uh, is at a lower rate. If you pay your credit card off um, every month, get a rewards card, one that gives you airline miles or that'll give you 1% cash back at least on every purchase. Some of them will still give you 3 to 5% back on restaurants or groceries or gas or whatever that type of card is. I use an American Express Blue Cash card. 
um, and after you've spent about six thousand dollars on that card it'll give you five percent on um, gas and restaurants and I mean it's I've made uh, so far this year about five hundred dollars cash back it's great um, and then you know consolidating your student loans um, or uh, finding in even a brokerage account if you're an active trader that um, you're going to spend less on your, your cost per trade. All of those things don't really require a change in your day-to-day -day behavior. They just require being a little smarter about which financial accounts you should have. Great. Um, so my biggest uh, financial mistake was probably um, you know, in terms of scope, it was probably you know not uh, cashing out uh, in the 2000 tech crash. But on a more personal note, it was I was 19. I had moved to Silicon Valley to work there for the summer. Um, apartments were really expensive. I didn't, since it was sort of the first move I had I had made, I didn't account for the cost of getting TV, internet, power set up, uh, all the furniture, all of the cleaning supplies and food and spices and cooking stuff that you need when you first set up an apartment. Overspent, um, it was the first and only time that I ever uh, had my account overdraft. Um, got hit with a fee. Um, the other part of the mistake that I made was I thought I had enough saved up, but I didn't realize that your first paycheck often takes not two weeks to get, but four weeks until you know payroll kicks in or until your direct deposit kicks in or if you open um, a new bank account sometimes um, to prevent fraud on their part they'll hold your check for four or five days or ten days to let it clear uh, when you think oh well I've got the check in hand or this is my pay period right now no it, you don't actually get to use the money for a couple weeks beyond that and so that sequence of timing and ill planning um, was just a bad combination and I was very very depressed and very mad at myself for making that mistake. Yeah as of late my uh, I guess the big surprise was I spent a lot more on travel and uh, hotels and uh, airfare than, um, than I ever thought. That's probably my biggest area of spend in fact it's probably at this point more than more than rent. Um, you know, I just sold my company. I'll have uh, good proceeds from that. I'll have plenty of uh, money to do as I please, um, but I won't. I'll still live in my one-bedroom apartment and drive my used cars um, and not go out too much. But the one thing that I won't curb anymore is you know, good travel and good experiences with fr friends and family. And so that'll, that'll be an area where I increase my mint budget.